So I'd like to welcome everybody to another monthly program of the Rhinebeck Historical Society. Uh, my name is Mike Frazier, and I am really delighted that the Historical Society this evening has as our speaker, our county historian. Um, I'm not sure how he's able to uh, handle the many requests that he gets and the many organizations that uh, he interacts with, but somehow he manages to handle all of them. And we're very fortunate to uh, have him with us again. Um, many of us remember when there was a period when there was no county historian and that position was left vacant uh, for a number of years. But in uh, 2012, the position was restored and uh, Dutchess County has been blessed ever since. Uh, and uh, Rhinebeck among the communities and historical societies that has benefited from what Will has been able to do. Um, so in March of 2017, some of us remember uh, Will joining Nancy Kelly in a talk about prohibition in Rhinebeck. And again, later in 2017, uh, using Dutchess County's ancient documents as his source, uh, spoke to our members about crime and society in Rhinebeck. And two years ago, we heard Will talking about an historical treasure that runs parallel to Route 9G, hidden right in our southeast corner, uh, namely the Palatine Farm, uh, Palatine Hamlet of Wurtemberg. Uh, and he followed up uh, this past October with a more detailed program about Wurtemberg. Uh, and this evening, he's shifting gears, uh, still staying uh, well in the past, uh, but he's taking us in a new direction to explore a most intriguing character from our 18th century history. Will, we're delighted to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that very generous introduction. And now we get to see if the technology is going to cooperate with us. So, are we looking good on the slide share? Excellent. All right, welcome everyone this evening for potentially the first of our presentations or my presentations that will moving Will, that will be moving towards Rev 250 here in Dutchess County. So Peter DeWitt was a rather important individual whom we've more or less lost track of in the intervening 250 years. But thanks to some archival discoveries and uh, a little bit of interest of mine and commercial activity, we're beginning to get a much better view of him. And we're going to be hearing more about him as well as other understudied seriously important revolutionary figures from Dutchess County as we move towards 2026 and beyond. So as usual, I like to begin by thanking the folks who have made these presentations possible for me, in addition to our wonderful sponsors, the Rhinebeck Historical Society. Melody Moore was actually the person who located the documents that form really the core of tonight's presentation, those being Peter DeWitt's three surviving business ledgers up at the New York Historic, oh, excuse me, the New York State Library and the DeWitt Family Papers. Also, thanks to Bill Jeffway, who was generous enough to retrieve Peter DeWitt's militia commission. We've wondered for years why his tombstone and monument at the Rhinebeck Reformed Church reads Captain Peter DeWitt, and now we actually have the original paperwork to prove it. And finally, I always like to thank my boss, Dutchess County Clerk Brad Kendall, whose generosity and support not only makes all of the programming I do possible, but also permitted me to slip up to Albany to see this resource, which has not been digitized. So as they say, it takes a village to uh, create a history program just as much as anything else. So what are we going to be doing tonight? You all know that I like to present a little roadmap so that you have an idea of where we'll be headed. We're going to begin with the obvious question of who was Peter DeWitt? He's a fellow whose name used to mean a lot, sort of not so much anymore, and it doesn't help the situation that there were at least three or four Peter DeWitts, all different people who were living in the Hudson Valley at roughly the same time. 
from that mini bio, we're going to briefly go into how the credit economy worked here in early Dutchess County. And by early, we're talking the colonial period. So officially 1683 to 1776. And bear in mind that during that period, Dutchess County was part of the British imperial colony of New York. And one of the British Empire's key financial policies was no hard currency in its colonies, because if the colonists have gold, silver, they can buy from anyone they want. But if they are tied to a credit system, the, uh, the final end point of that credit system is back in Great Britain. So that keeps the colonies financially loyal. And then finally, we're going to dip into some micro history in terms of, all right, account ledgers are fun for those of us who enjoy numbers, but what do they actually tell us about the lived experience of early residents here in Dutchess County? So, Peter DeWitt, you can see the rundown there if you uh, want to read rather than listen. He is part of the DeWitt family of Kingston. So these are early Dutch settlers that um, turned up in Kingston in the 17th century. He is born to the west of Kingston, if I'm right on my directions tonight, in uh, Marble Town. He ends up moving over to Dutchess County. And this is one of the ways in which we can disambiguate Peter DeWitt from, for example, the Peter DeWitt who lived roughly the same period in time, roughly same birth dates, death dates, and Kingston and was a clergyman of the Dutch Reformed Church over there. Both went by Peter or Petrus DeWitt at various times, but there's only one here in Dutchess County. So his mother is Anne Pauling. And for those of you who follow the, the intricate history of land title here in Dutchess County, and if you do, please let me know. It'd be nice to know someone else who's interested in that rabbit hole. Anne Pauling is the daughter of the Pauling who purchased what is basically Statsburg, becomes Pauline's patent. So she has land interests in there, and that's why Peter ends up in, in the Statsburg area, because he's settling on land owned by his mother. He might be coming over the river, might be seen as a little bit of an interloper, but that doesn't last for long, because in 1749, he marries into the Radcliffe family, a pretty prominent local family that stretches all the way from modern Hyde Park up into modern Red Hook. So he's coming from a pretty important family over in Ulster County and make sure that he's going to marry into an important family here in Dutchess County. Thanks to Bill Jeffway's generosity, we have his captain's commission in the Dutchess County militia from 1758. And certain genealogical sources suggest that either in 1758 or 1759, he was part of the New York troops who went up to try to take Fort Ticonderoga from the French. In 1758, they were rather disastrously unsuccessful, but in 1759, more so. Once he is back, that is pretty much the end of his military service, which is one way, again, you can disambiguate between the three or four Peter DeWitts or DeWitts who were running around. But essentially from the moment he moves over here to Dutchess County, he starts to set up a pretty serious diversified commercial operation. So he's got sawmills, he's got grist mills, he runs a store. It's all the stuff that is needed in the colonial economy because you've got to be able to um, you know, grind your grain into flour. You need boards to build things, especially houses. And you need all of those manufactured goods that are coming out of Great Britain. Because again, as an imperial colony, we're supposed to be sending all the raw materials back to Britain and then in exchange through that credit economy, receiving manufacturers. But at the same time, there are some hints in his store records that show that there is some low level industrial activity going on here in Dutchess County, mostly because he's getting the cut of the action. And finally, for those who haven't uh, gotten on the Peter DeWitt bandwagon yet, let me assure you that he was a big deal during the Imperial Crisis and during the American Revolution. And his letters to his kinsmen and also to such agencies as the New York Provincial Congress give us an interesting and illustrative look into what was actually happening here in Dutchess County during the war. So there is a beautiful image there. 
of uh, Peter DeWitt's Militia Commission. And this is one of the first indications we have that Peter is a big deal because to be commissioned as a captain, and that's the commander of a company in the New York uh, Colonial Militia, is not a small thing. These companies are not filled up by election. In other words, you don't have the privates and corporals and sergeants of the company get together and vote who they're going to have as their lieutenants and their captain. These are gubernatorial appointments, as you can see up at the top there, James Delancey, who's the lieutenant governor and the acting governor at this point in time. You have to be pretty high up the political ladder to get a commission like this in the first place, and especially to go directly in as a captain, which DeWitt does. We don't have any evidence of him serving in the entry-level rank of ensign or lieutenant to begin with. So where are we setting our story? Where is Peter DeWitt located? So here you have a detail off of the 1797 map of Clinton, Stanford, Washington, and Amenia. You can see three of those four town names up there. This was part of the overall change in municipal taxation that Nancy Kelly wrote about in regards to Rhinebeck. And Rhinebeck does have the prettiest map to come out of that. I might be a little bit biased since I live in 18th century Rhinebeck, uh, 21st century Red Hook, but I'll let the art historians uh, debate that. And as Mike has noted, two of my presentations for Rhinebeck have been on Württemberg. And yes, we are not strained too far from that theme, because if you look there in the upper right, you'll see that Württemberg is just off the map over in Rhinebeck. And if you look at the top line there, right under where Rhinebeck is spelled with a Y, that's more or less the same boundary between the town of Hyde Park and the town of Rhinebeck today. So we look at this map, we see if you look really closely or have a nice large screen, numbers next to little drawings of houses and other buildings. And it's those numbers that allow us to zero in on where DeWitt was located. Now, bear in mind again, this map is from 1797 and Peter DeWitt dies in 1790, but he is still remembered because when you look at the map legend, which is not part of this detail, you see that number 13 is the house and sawmill that belonged to Peter DeWitt when he was alive. It's not unusual to see estates and properties uh, labeled on maps by the names of their former owners who've been deceased for some time for 10 or more years after the passing of that individual. It just shows what a big mark they left in the local landscape. And then of course, number 19 is John DeWitt, Peter's son, who serves during the American Revolution. That's his house, the grist mill, and uh, also probably the location of Peter DeWitt's store, whose records we're going to be looking at a little later here. Now, I understand that you may not want to zoom in and out to figure out where these things are. So there you have them. The uh, lower red circle on the left is number 13, Peter DeWitt's house, which is probably Rockdale, his second home. The circle up on the right is where his store was, his grist mill, one of the two sawmills. Now the sawmill is down uh, at that location, number 13. And somewhere in that area was his original home of Wits Mount, which is also spelled Wits Mount. It's the 18th century, and you get bonus points if you can spell the same name or term multiple different ways in the same document. So that's I'm going with that spelling just because that's the one that pretty much amuses me the most. So when we zoom into this situation again, and a little bit to help with disambiguation, the blue circle down there is DeWitt's later home of uh, Rockdale. And up to the right with the red circle is really where his commercial operations were. How does that translate onto the modern landscape? Well, thanks to Google Maps, we can take a quick look here. And we see that Peter's last home is down pretty much where the entrance to Margaret Norrie State or Mills Norrie State Park is located today. On the other hand, his major commercial operations, including that sawmill and grist mill, which would have been water powered, are up in the modern hamlet of Pleasant Plains. And if you take, um, I believe it's Hollow Road off of Route 9G today, and you follow it up towards the Pleasant Plains Presbyterian Church, you will still see the dam from that operation there. It, went through several different changes of hands after DeWitt's death and when John DeWitt got out of the business, but it has most recently been known as Frost's Mills. So that's where we are on the landscape in that area, which historically, 
has been associated with Rhinebeck, though never technically part of Rhinebeck. And we'll see how close that association is in just a few minutes here. All right, so Peter DeWitt's a big deal. I've made this case for you. We don't actually have a collection of his papers, at least not one that I have located yet. The DeWitt family papers contain some material from him, but mostly from his son and subsequent descendants. However, he was enough of an evocative writer that uh, folks in the um, 19th and early 20th centuries did us the favor of publishing several of his letters. This is the earliest one that I found to date from 1769. And it puts us right in that imperial crisis that we associate with the Stamp Act, followed by the Townsend duties, which were on a number of articles. All of those end up being repealed except for the tax on tea, which leads to the Boston Tea Party in 1773. And then the Boston Closure Acts, and it's more or less inevitable that we're gonna have a revolution in this country. But this letter is from 1769. Peter is writing to his much more famous and less easy to mix up with other people, cousin Charles DeWitt, who's a big deal over in Kingston. He's a lawyer. He ends up being the colonel of one of New York's minute companies because minute companies, minute men, were not just a Massachusetts phenomenon. Basically, every colony put those together. So to give us an idea of when this is hitting, in 1767, Parliament had passed the Townshend Acts. They begin repealing elements of that in 1768 and then into 1769. Most of the time when we talk about the American response to the Townshend duties, we talk about Massachusetts and specifically Boston, because that's where you saw the most outraged responses, mob action things being burned, all that kind of good stuff. New York at this point in time was developing uh, a reputation as a Tory colony, as being very, very strongly attached to the British government. So much so that when things start to go awry in 1775 and 1776, there are active discussions within the uh, Connecticut legislature, which by that time has become a state legislature, about invading and taking over New York City to force all of the Tories out of it, potentially even burning Manhattan before Washington does in September of 1776. So to be anti-government at this point in time, to be a Whig, as they were known in uh, the political parlance of the colonies, is a pretty dangerous position to be taking here in New York, even a relatively safe distance away from New York City. So Peter is writing a response to his cousin Charles, who has asked Peter to intervene in some elections to try to get more votes for uh, candidates that are friendly to the Whig cause. Peter, of course, remarks that the letter arrived too late for him to intervene, but solicits his uh, cousin's help in Dutchess County elections. And you'll notice this poor county in there if you're reading the transcript of Peter's letter. This was a point in time when Duchess was actually the uh, younger brother to Ulster, not in terms of dates of creation, but in terms of um, economic prosperity. This was a financially poorer county in the 18th and part of the early 19th century. So you can see here that we have a slow growth in the 1760s in this anti-British government, um, one might say conspiracy, one might say movement. Peter DeWitt is deeply involved in it. So our next look at Peter DeWitt <coughs> comes from 1775. He is writing to the New York Provincial Congress. So even before Lexington and Concord, New York had formed what was technically an illegal assembly because the, the only assembly that had government powers was the colonial assembly, which could only be called into sitting by the colonial governor at that point, William Tryon, who had kept the assembly prorogued or basically dismissed everyone, go back to your homes since early 1775. But of course, the Patriot cause here in um, Dutchess County and in New York in general was not going to sit on its hands. So those folks had formed this provincial Congress. Peter DeWitt writes a long letter to them in August of 1775. It has all sorts of stuff in there. These are just two excerpted paragraphs. So the one on the left talks about loyalist activity. There are three folks who are just brazenly loyalist. They've been told to leave the county, but they've come back in. They are bearing arms actively, something that you're not supposed to do once the committees of safety have invited you to leave. 
Worse than that, they are disrupting the reorganization of the militia because throughout the summer of 1775, a petition called the Association was being circulated through all of the counties in New York. And this was basically your opportunity to sign a piece of paper that says, we are in favor of American rights and we're willing to do what's necessary to guarantee the rights of Americans under the English constitution. Because of course, at this point in time, there's only one constitution in the world. It's not written down, but it is in English. That's the English constitution. If you refuse to sign that association, things were not going to go well for you. You were branded a Tory. You were either told to sit tight under house arrest or to get out of the county. These three individuals had chosen the latter option, but came back. They are walking around. They're disrupting the attempt to reorganize the militia so that it only contains folks who've signed that association. Hitherto, the militia was every able-bodied man between 18 and uh, estimates vary, but more or less until the point where you were no longer able bodied. There was no hard and fast upper limit for age. But now in August, you want only those able bodied men who are loyal to the American cause, not quite independence yet, but definitely a different governmental relationship with Great Britain. It doesn't help, <laughs> doesn't help the situation when Timothy Doty, Adam Berg, and Christian Berg Jr all show up. They try to mess up the organization of this militia company by calling out the commander, William Radcliffe, who, of course, is a relation by marriage of Peter DeWitt at this point in time. And then even worse, these three guys go around and start recruiting Dutchess County men to serve in the king's army. Because, yes, it is not 1776 yet. We haven't declared independence, but it's definitely going to be a war and there are going to be provincial regiments raised. Those are regiments made up of American residents. So it's, it's clearly bad. And Peter DeWitt wants the New York Provincial Congress to know that, hey, you know what? You can't necessarily count on Dutchess County unless you're going to give us some money and some men from more loyal, loyal to the American cause areas like Ulster County to kick all of these loyalists out. And that's what you see on the right-hand side um, excerpt there is some of Peter DeWitt's thoughts about uh, how we can do this, bring in militia from other districts, reach out to our friends in Connecticut. Sure, they want to burn New York City to the ground, but on the other hand, New York City's full of Tories, so didn't they somehow earn that treatment? And then he goes on to talk about, here are the officers that you want to appoint because they're both good and loyal to the American cause. And here are the ones that you don't want to deal with and much other sort of down in the weeds, spilled tea, gossipy things, because Peter DeWitt was, if nothing else, a tremendous gossip, which makes his letters extremely valuable for historians today. So finally, our last one that uh, I was able to dig up is from 1777. The war is raging and... Uh, Peter is now in the grip of the Continental Army's supply problems. It's still pretty early in the war in terms of supply problems. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And his son, who is an officer in the, the Whig, as it were, or the state of New York's Dutchess County Militia, has been tasked with finding flour for the Continental Army. It's one thing to find flour. And of course, it makes sense that Peter DeWitt's son would be the one um, tasked with getting it because his father owns a grist mill. But you have to be able to transport that flour. And it turns out that there aren't really that many barrel makers in this part of Dutchess County in the 1770s. There do happen to be three, all of whom are Tories, that were uh, exiled to Exeter, which if I recall correctly, and if uh, I do not, I hope someone will correct me in the comments section. Um, Exeter over in Connecticut, where a lot of New York loyalists were sent over the state line because Connecticut was much more avowedly loyal to the American cause than the King's cause. Well, they've very quietly slipped back into Dutchess County. And Peter is writing again to his cousin Charles, who has a great deal of influence to say, is there any chance that we can basically get these guys paperwork that would tell the Continental Army and the militia and the committees of safety to leave them alone as long as they make barrels for the American war effort? Because if we can't strike that deal, we're not going to be able to to transport the flour that the Continental Army needs. So you see, in not too long a space of time, there's a huge attitude shift here from loyalists, too many of them, we gotta get them out of here, we've gotta stamp down the Tory threat. And by 1777, well, 
you know, we can probably let these ones hang out as long as they're useful. A little bit of mellowing once you get into the war and uh, you need to start making compromises to getting stuff done. So for those who are wondering, because the next slide is going to tie in with this, how the revolution in Duchess really sort of kicked off, everything was great here until May of 1776. And in May of 1776, which is one of the months in which the courts meet, the courts were closed by uh, American patriots, or if you prefer the other perspective, rebels. And with that, county government basically shuts down until July or sorry, June of 1777, when the Board of Supervisors and Supervisors like today are the leaders of every town meet again in Poughkeepsie. It's a very different cast from what it was last in 1775. We actually, because there's not a meeting in 1776, we don't have a list of who would have been in office at that point in time. But if you're looking at the slide with us, you'll see that the second name down is Peter DeWitt because he becomes the supervisor of Rhinebeck. Technically, he's not living in the colonial precinct, which is what the, the term is they use for towns at that point in time as precincts. But he's significant enough that his is the only name on this list that could possibly be the supervisor for, um, for Rhinebeck. Because at this point in time, Hyde Park doesn't exist as a polity. Neither does Clinton. What you have is Charlotte Precinct, which reaches all the way from the Hudson Valley east to the border with Armenia, a tremendously huge chunk of territory that eventually is divided up into the modern towns of, and let's see if I can get all of this right, Hyde Park, Stanford, Washington, Pleasant Valley, and Clinton. So that's five modern towns that come out of this colonial precinct. So he's there in 1777. He is still there in 1780 and on into the 1780s. And these come from the books of supervisors that are preserved today down in Poughkeepsie and the Dutchess County Clerk's Office. So he is pretty busy during the war leading the precinct of Rhinebeck and also being a seriously important part of Dutchess County government. So he's a big deal politically. He's got ties, he's related to the right people, either by genetics or by marriage. And um, he's playing a pretty important role in the organization of the county. Hopefully I've made that case for you. If not, let me know what would convince you. So now we turn to his account books and also to the ways in which the credit economy worked in Dutchess County. So just to backtrack a moment, just to remind us all, hard specie is not technically in circulation here in Dutchess County. If you go to the store to buy something, in, in this case, 1764, you aren't paying in gold, silver, or copper. There are occasional issues of paper money by the colonial government of New York, but it's seriously frowned upon by the imperial government, and it's more or less something that's used by the elites, not something that gets down to the more workaday members of society. So more or less, everything you do is based on credit. All the purchases that you make off of your farm or home or however it is that you're living. What you're looking at here is the top of the first page of his store journal, which runs from 1764 into the 1780s. You see the, that this is the classic example of double record, double entry bookkeeping. So on the left there, you have the debt that is owed. So in this particular case, these are all of the things that Maria Weist is buying from Peter DeWitt's store. And on the right, you have the credit. This is how Maria Weist is paying for all of that stuff. Now, theoretically, and in most of the cases that I've run across, at the bottom, and if you look at the bottom, you'll see, especially on the left-hand side there, that there is a sum. Those two sums even out. That's the whole idea of double-entry bookkeeping. Doesn't always work that way in real life. But uh, that's more or less how it works in the 18th century. And this is the rough equivalent to looking at your credit card statement today. Things haven't changed that much. The record keeping is more or less uh, along that debt credit relationship. So what can we learn from this? Let's start with the debt part of things. Up there at the top, you see it's labeled debt or sometimes it's labeled debt. Various and sundry different uh, nomenclature involved here. But to break all of that down for you, rather than transcribing it, you've got a couple of classes of material. First, you've got cloth. 
it can be produced here. You've got this idea of homespun, but it's just cheaper and easier and better to buy it from Britain because they've been in the cloth business since the medieval period. And by this time, they have water-powered cloth factories over there, you know, machine-driven looms. So they've got some pretty good stuff going. She's buying linen. She's buying silk. She's buying wool. She's buying mixed fibers. So it's, it's a reminder that Dutchess County is part of the global economy as early as the 1760s, and in fact, far before that. Next, you've got trimmings as sort of a rough category there. You've got the thread that you need to sew things. You've got binding, which is strips of tape, but it doesn't always have to technically be tape that you use to cover raw edges. Bonnet paper, if you look down at the bottom there, you can see silk bonnets, which are the one of the more popular headwear options for women during this period. The bonnet paper is what is inside the brim of that bonnet. They're pretty exclusively made out of silk and the paper gives it that shape. You also have tools, she's buying scissors, she's buying needles. She's even getting labor out of this deal. Someone is making that bonnet for her rather than her making it for herself. And then finally, she does get some food from the store, things that you can't make on site. So rum, for example, comes out of the Caribbean made with molasses. You get sugar and of course, tea doesn't grow that well here in Dutchess County, despite the presence of Harney and Company here. So it's a, the kind of stuff that you would expect to see someone buying in 18th century Dutchess County. The interesting thing comes up with how is she going to pay for all of this? So it's basically going to be an in-kind um, commercial transaction one way or another. And what you see in the transcription that you can read below there is she is going to literally work off her bill. Today we have the joke of, all right, you go out to eat, you order more stuff than you can pay for. You're going to work that bill off in the kitchen washing dishes. Well, here she works that bill off by performing some form of labor for Peter DeWitt or someone who owes him money who's going to square off the deal because credit gets super duper complicated to trace during this period of really not hard cash in circulation or theoretically not in circulation. She could be doing household labor. She could be doing some type of skilled labor, such as sewing. It may be that that whole labor for making a bonnet is just because she didn't feel like doing it or didn't want to do that sort of finicky work herself. But for whatever purpose, however she is laboring, she serves for five and a half months. The deal is done between Peter DeWitt Maria and her father, because at this point in time, even though women do have a, a certain level of independency in the law as compared to other colonies, there are still limits. But she works this out and her account is cleared. And that's more or less how things are supposed to work in the credit economy of colonial duchess. But I'm sure everyone can come up with scenarios where you end up going to the store and you buy more than it is easy for you to work off. We aren't going to be touching on any of those tonight because Peter DeWitt was pretty, pretty straight up when he was keeping his books, even if that didn't necessarily always reflect the reality of things. So here we have John Kane, and this is where we begin to see how these um, books tell us about networks. So with Maria's entry, we see that her father is involved. Here with John Kane, we see up there that his wife, who could be Jemesna, it's uh, potentially Dutch, it's potentially me not reading the letter between the I and the N properly, it could be an R, some of this stuff gets weird, we'll touch on that later on. But these are presumably things that she is buying on his account with the store. And you can see there's wool, wool stuff, stuff is a type of wool at this period. There's linen, she's buying thread because she's clearly sewing stuff. And then she's either buying for herself or for him a snuff box and then the stuff that you fill that with, which in this case is the, uh, the slang head and pluck. So snuff is a pretty big deal in the 18th century. You have two ways of uh, relieving the pressure of everyday life. You have alcohol in its various forms and then you have tobacco in its various forms. In the 18th century, they enjoyed snuff as much if not more so than smoking a pipe. So you have a snuff box there to give you an idea of what uh, John Kane or his wife may have been purchasing from Peter DeWitt. So how are they going to work this off? Well, here we have an example 
of that industrial, semi-industrial stuff that is happening here that's maybe potentially not supposed to be because over in England, they have machines for knitting stockings. And they've had machines for the knitting stockings since Queen Elizabeth was on the throne. But here we see that either John Cain or his wife could really be either one are knitting stockings and they are also spinning thread or yarn, depending on which uh, term you want to use, from flax grown here in Dutchess County. Some of these stockings that they are knitting are um, pretty advanced. They're rid stockings. You can see a modern example on the right there that takes uh, more skill than knitting, knitting just a plain stocking. And then at the bottom there, and it's transcribed for you, um, there is a knitting of three pairs of stockings for Peter DeWitt's enslaved individuals, his enslaved laborers. You see the, the period term there. More or less, whenever we see that term, it denotes enslaved labor. And we will see why, because when, they, uh, when they're talking about a free person of color, they call that out. All right. And is that potentially the only example of uh, enslaved people popping up? A little bit of foreshadowing. Not so much. So Daniel Mills, per his wife, Martha. So both of them are in, involved in this account. What are they getting from Peter? They are getting potatoes, so many potatoes. Because if you can read that script, one bushel of potato, one and a half bushes, bushels of potatoes, a half bushel of potato, which just goes on and on. They were big into potatoes. They're buying starch, which is probably for laundry purposes rather than cooking purposes. And then, as I mentioned uh, earlier, sometimes I look at this stuff and folks, I've been reading this sort of handwriting for close to 30 years now. And I still don't know what three pounds of grofy or grossy wool is. Could be Dutch. Dutch does turn up in this stuff because I'm guessing that the two girt florets might also be Dutch. If you have an insight into this, please let me know. So how is Daniel Mills or his wife going to work this off? Well, first of all, they're spinning and gespunnen. There's some Dutch for you. So they're taking flax and they are turning in it into usable thread or fiber. They are also doing some other stuff that I have no idea right now what it means. The two him de Gnult for Cornelis, which means something for a guy named uh, Cornelius. They make an interesting distinction here, which I know of from other 18th century uh, sources about shoemaker's thread, because for those of you who've been to Colonial Williamsburg, Sturbridge, or anywhere else where they have uh, historical trades going, shoemakers are using an entirely different level of thread than the folks who are making clothes, because think about it, that thread is going to be subjected to a lot more stress than anything uh, normally in a shirt or a pair of breeches or a coat because it's making contact with the ground and with paved services all the time. And uh, shoemakers are of course trained to make their own thread, but why make your own thread when you can later buy it from Peter DeWitt who is probably stocking his shelves with stuff that people are making for him to pay off his debt. And again, we see enslaved people popping up because either Daniel or his wife are making three shirts for them. So this is a reminder of how something as innocuous as uh, a store ledger can tell you a lot about who was around in 18th century Dutchess County and their roles in local society. All right, so remember how I said that uh, that term normally corresponds to enslaved uh, persons of color now we see an entry that is uh, coming out of Peter's account book, his Ledger B, if you look at the finding aid on the New York State Library website, that specifically calls out a free person of color. Now in the store ledger, which is a different book physically, we get to see those itemized lists of what people are getting in exchange for their labor or in kind or whatnot. Here in Ledger B, and also to a large extent in Ledger A, you have a lot of what we see in the ancient documents when it comes to debt suits, which is, all right, what is uh, Sam Quack getting from Peter? He's getting sundries, which means a bunch of stuff that the account clerk could not be bothered to uh, itemize for him. He's also getting bread down there, you can see at the bottom, but mostly it's sundries, occasionally it's cash. 
Just because the British government says you shouldn't have cash doesn't mean that you don't have cash. But also we sometimes see that cash is actually as confusing as it is and is frequently confusing to me. It is a term used in credit systems for just generalized credit. So cash can be three pounds worth of credit rather than three pounds in hard specie. And in these contexts, it's not easy to tell what it all is. So what is Sam Quack doing in order to pay off his debts to Peter DeWitt? Well, we get, uh, as we do on some of these things, uh, an indication of what his profession is. He is a woodcutter. And in the 18th century, pretty much any form of heating, cooking, and many industrial project processes are uh, run by fire. You've got to have a steady supply of wood. So he is providing some cord wood, but he's also spinning cloth. So tow there is a certain quality level of linen cloth. And we see through Peter's books that they're growing a lot of flax here, at least in Northern Duchess at this time. So he's got cord wood, of course, clearing land, cutting wood, all sorts of stuff to keep his accounts balanced with Peter. So this is all great stuff for the, the interpersonal level of how does Peter DeWitt's store operate? But Peter doesn't become uh, a pretty serious individual in 18th century Dutchess County and in the wider Rhinebeck, uh, Statsburg area because he runs a store. There are people who do, but uh, he does not limit himself to just that level of commerce. He is also engaged in high commerce. For example, in 1788, jumping a little bit ahead in terms of time, but not in terms of theme, he decides he's going to get into the brick business. So if you think back to that map of where his house and operations were down at number 13, close to where Mills Nori State Park is today, that is located on the Indikil which is today the Indian kill. So you see a debit here, which is in this case, Peter DeWitt owing James Corkin for five and a half days, or otherwise, as you may read that fraction work, that basically he is setting up the various and sundry things needed to make bricks. On the other side of that page, you have the profit. So over the course of roughly a year, beginning in August of 1788, Peter DeWitt's people, and in this case, it is almost certainly going to be his enslaved laborers, make nearly 31,000 bricks. That's a lot of bricks. That's at least the number he's sold. They've probably made more than that. And if you ever want to look into 18th century brick making, check out the Colonial Williamsburg website because that is one of the trades they still have going. And let's flip back for a moment to see what was Peter's cost outlay? So you see there it's 15 shillings, one and a half pence, because back in the 18th century, a hay penny was still a serious thing. In fact, you see British government accounts in the millions of pounds calculated down to the hay penny level, sometimes the farthing, if you really want to get detailed. So he's in it for 15 shillings and change. His profit for one year of sales is 22 pounds, which is a pretty serious amount of money. Someone like Sam Quack, who is a common laborer, can maybe in a good year make four pounds worth of income. So this is a lot out of just one of the things that uh, Peter DeWitt is involved in on a serious commercial level. What else is he involved in? Sawmills. You saw that called out in his uh, in the map from 1797. At that point in the time, the DeWitt family has at least two. This is just one entry for sawmills. And you can see over in the right-hand column there, this is all the profit that's coming out of the sawmills. And it's um, the cash that he is being paid, whether it being actually hard currency or yet another debt transaction based on something someone owes someone else. He's got a pretty serious uh, income stream coming from that because that basically October of 1759 with charges going up until 1775. But there are other entries in this book because you know, it's a book, it's not a computer. Sometimes you just need to start a new page on this stuff rather than keeping it all in one page. It's a major operation. What else do we have? We have fat cattle because no one wants to buy thin cattle. Any cattleman can tell you that. Where does fat cattle come in? Where is Peter getting this stuff? Well, if you 
either recall or go back and watch my second presentation on um, Württemberg, which touches on some of Peter DeWitt's accounts with the Württembergers, the Germans who are living there, you'll see that they tend to pay off their store bills, which unfortunately are mostly just sundries and cash with a variety of um, products from their farms, including fat cattle. So Rhinebeck at this point in time is in the cattle business. Peter is receiving it in terms of payment for things that he is selling at his store. Then he is turning around and selling it. And for those who want to know, where do the fat cattle go? Most of them tend to go down to New York City, where they are either used to feed the population. Well, they are in a combination used to feed the population, and then their hides go to the leather manufacturing business. And that is, uh, for example, it's a big deal because New York then, as today, has a pretty serious appetite vis-a-vis -vis everything above and to the west and east of it. We have Route 22 today because to satisfy New York's need for beef and for hides for leather, folks up in Vermont could make a profit driving cattle down to New York City. Clearly not going to be as fat as Dutchess County cattle uh, by the time they get down there, but that's the level of demand there. Similarly, pork. Pork is really important during this point in time because it's very easy to salt it, to put it in barrels, and to send it basically around the world. Most of your major transatlantic and Pacific voyages, the sailors are going to be surviving a lot of that off of salted pork. Salted fish is the 17th century version, but we've got plenty of pigs running around in 18th century Dutchess County, and some of those are used to pay off people's debts at Peter DeWitt store. So now we're rolling into our conclusion, and we're going to talk just briefly about the reach of Peter DeWitt's commercial operation. So with the meat part of the business, his reach goes down to New York City. We've got individual accounts for merchants who are identified as coming out of New York City. We know the Wurzenbergers who are just north of him and Rhinebeck, scattered along Crum Elbow and then all the way west to the river are coming down to his store to buy. We know that folks that are further east of him and the nine partners are buying, but he also has some pretty higher, higher level clientele, including the United States of America, the continental government, which in 1779 buys bricks from him. So that lets us know that 1788 is not his first foray into the brick um, business. Now, of course, the issue with um, doing government contracts, especially in the middle of the American Revolution, is that it's not always certain that you're going to be paid and if you are paid, what they're going to pay you in. That's why uh, there is the, the expression of useless continental script or not worth a continental because the Continental Congress is not shy about printing paper money without any hard gold, silver, or assets to back it up. So I'll give you a moment to make your bet on whether the United States pays up. And we now see absolute blank in the credit column. So thank you, Peter DeWitt, for 40,000 bricks. Um, we'll catch you on the flip side with this debt like probably never. On the other hand, Peter also does business with Dutchess County because when you are a town supervisor, when you have to leave your town to go down to Poughkeepsie for the annual supervisor's meeting, although by this time they're meeting four times a year, the county picks up your bill for travel. It also picks up the bill for any time you spend doing county service, such as either assessing taxes, collecting taxes, or, and this is the reason they meet down in Poughkeepsie a couple of times a year, looking at all of the um, claims against Dutchess County for various and sundry services that are performed and deciding, yes, we're going to pay those. No, we are not going to pay those. So, uh, this is the debit column in terms of how much he is charging the county for his services and expenses. 12 pounds, 13 shillings, 2 pence. Again, remember, this is a period in time in which a laborer might, in a good year, bring in 4 pounds. So that's this is not a whole lot of his time and effort, and he's claiming 12 pounds for it. Will Dutchess County pay when the, the not yet federal, the confederal government won't? What do you think? Well, as it turns out, the answer is yes, because Dutchess County always pays its debts. We don't get to defaults like uh, state and federal governments do. 
And on that happy note, I'll bring tonight's presentation to an end. You've got my contact information there if you uh, need to reach out. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. I'm going to stop the share and uh, be happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Will. The, uh, I am fascinated by the detail in those ledgers and actually uh, stunned by the amount of money involved in the fat cattle. I was looking at the, uh, the totals there and it was over a hundred pounds several times. Yeah. That's incredible. He is, he is a super duper big deal. And the DeWitts remained a serious family and in certain areas, they still are a pretty uh, financially well-to-do family today. That's, that's the colonial wealth. That's the Knickerbocker Society of the uh, the Gilded Age. Those folks who can trace their roots back to people like Peter DeWitt. We've got a good number of people here. Uh, Jeff, have you any uh, questions that you need to relay from our viewers? Yes, we have a we have well a question from Maya. Maya okay. asks, what is the connection to Providence in Sam Quack's ledger? Is this Providence, Rhode Island? It is not Providence, Rhode Island, although I understand why uh, you would suggest that it is, because that was also my first thought about what? But <laughs> normally when you see something weird in Dutchess County history like that, there is an explanation for it. So the area that we today know as Pleasant Plains or Frost's Mills, because they both they're contiguous with one another, was initially known as Providence because the the story of the Pleasant Plains Church, the one you see today, is a Greek revival structure. But that goes all the way back into the mid 18th century when uh, a Presbyterian organization received permission to first begin setting up an operation there. And um, the area was called Providence at that time because that was part of the extremely lengthy name of that church association. Thank you. So a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, you can chat them to me, the host, and I'll forward them to Will. Or if you go to the bottom of your screen, move your pointer to the bottom, click on reactions, and then uh, click on raise hand. Or I've uh, enabled anyone to uh, unmute their mics. So if you have a question, make sure your mic is unmuted. And uh, why don't you go ahead? Sarah Brower, you had a question? I think. Uh, yeah. in yes, sir. Yes, I do. Uh, I was a bit late entering the uh, webinar due to a pinochle game. But anyway, uh, where is uh, Peter's uh, ledger located? Peter's three ledgers are located at the New York State Library and the DeWitt Family Papers. Oh, okay. And they are... They are open by uh, appointment to be seen at the New York State Archives, which occupies, I think, the floor above the New York State Library. So they're free and open to the public. I photographed all of the store journal and then got pieces of the two store ledgers. So I've got to go back up and uh, photograph the rest because one of the things that I missed that I would have loved to have talked about today, and as usual, my presentations are always parts of works in progress, so we will have more data on Peter DeWitt's operations moving forward in time. Wheat was the cash crop in Dutchess County, basically right up until the point when the Erie Canal was finished. And he has so many pages in these lectures dedicated to the amount of wheat he is receiving as payment for uh, things purchased at his store, and also his dealing in the wheat market, which was just like mind-blowingly serious amounts of money. If you thought fat cattle was a serious economic activity, you know, uh, wheat just far surpasses it. It's what the Reynolds family of Poughkeepsie actually made its fortune on a century later, is just being middle people for the 
the movement of wheat from west to east. I think Frank uh, Pelea has a question. Frank, go ahead. You okay. need to unmute yourself first. Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering if there are any DeWitt family members still around, and if so, how and how would we know them, and who are they? Well, in terms of folks who still bear the surname DeWitt, I am not personally familiar with any here in Dutchess County, but it has also been my experience that once the family arrives in Dutchess County, it tends to maintain a presence in Dutchess County for the rest of time. Hence, uh, there's still um, Van Cleeks hanging around, uh, Ben Schotens, Boone Schotens, all of the old Dutch names. I do know that um, you know, the DeWitts are a Kingston headquartered family, that some DeWitts from Louisiana traveled up to Kingston a couple of summers ago and interfaced with the county clerk's office and the city historian's office over there. So these families are still alive, not necessarily always concentrated where they were 200 years ago. Okay, thank you. One of, one of the things, uh, Will, that I found interesting was the amount of money that was being paid to Peter DeWitt from Dutchess County, the, the 12 pounds, I think, was the amount, which, again, is a staggering amount. But my understanding, and let me know if what your take is on this, because I know later on when the a supervisor of a particular municipality was being paid by the county, he wasn't being paid so much for his time or his labor. He was, in fact, being reimbursed for a lot of the costs that he had incurred in his role. If, for example, it would be the supervisor who was responsible for the costs of running a poorhouse in the community, and every community had one. Um, and there may have been construction costs on the uh, post road, for example, or there may have been other kinds of costs. And uh, I've, I've seen not from the late 1700s, but from the uh, later on in the 1800s, uh, a record of what all those costs were, because initially I was taken aback at how much I said you no, 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 the county can't be paying these people that much. And indeed, they were paying them that much, but it was intended to be a reimbursement. It is a reimbursement. And the 18th century and for most of the 19th century, here in, um, in New York, we did not have municipal poorhouses. The poorhouses come out of the Yates Act of 1824. The first one here in Dutchess County is down in Poughkeepsie, and then, of course, that's initially shared with the city of Poughkeepsie. Then the second poorhouse is built out in Washington. But this is, again, a down in the weeds sort of if you work for municipal government and are a historian, this is a distinction that matters because you did have municipal officers called overseers of the poor. They were supposed to find lodging as well as food and clothing for the deserving poor. And it's not unusual to see all of those deserving poor living in the same building. It's not necessarily a purpose-built government poorhouse like we think of in the, the 19th century, but it's kind of de facto same purposes. Now, things like the expense of the poor or of the poor relief, as it is called during the period, are paid out of county taxes. I have not looked down into the details to see if that is reimbursement yet. Um, it's it again ties into all sorts of complicated financial stuff, but we do actually have the bills that uh, municipal officials from supervisors down to assessors and the overseers of the highways who have to make sure that things like the post road are kept up. We do have the bills that they send to Dutchess County. They're actually in the ancient documents because a lot of stuff and bear in mind that the, the board of supervisors is here well into the 19th century just to check accounts. When actual decisions on governance are to be made, those are being made by the judges in the county court. So a lot of things like 
bills being sent to the county end up being held in our court records because the judges looked it over and decided, is this a reasonable bill to submit to the supervisors, which is how we have this stuff. So yes, it is reimbursement for their expenses and quotation marks because it's people like Peter DeWitt who are deciding how much it costs them to perform these services. There's no sort of check up to see, well, you know, um, did he actually have to lay out this amount of money and feed for his horse, for example, to ride around doing X, Y, or Z services. So these officials are deciding what their time and their, uh, their labor, as it were, is worth, but it's not quite the same as saying, yeah, you know, you have to pay me to go do this. Nothing is, is simple or straightforward in government in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Nothing simple. Um, and Maya says, well, thanks for the clarification on her earlier question and says, if I may ask another, another question, was there a mm -hmm. relationship, business or otherwise, between the DeWitt family and the Livingston family? There are accounts in his books for Livingstons. Now, when you say Livingston family, I have to bring up the fact that not all Livingstons were created equally. There were some like um, Robert Livingston, the chancellor, who lives up in the big house in Claremont. But there are people like James G. Livingston who live in Rhinebeck and are more or less gentlemen farmers. They're not that indistinguishable from the, the Boone Shotens, the Van Cleeks, those Palatine farmers and others when it comes to it. So the Livingstons that we see, we do have a couple of merchants who are coming up from New York City. And since they have accounts because they are supplying Peter DeWitt's uh, store. But we also see relatively low level DeWitt's who are part of basically the middle class of 18th and early 19th century Dutchess County. So they pop up, but it's not as though... Peter DeWitt is necessarily running a book for the, the chief of the Livingstons because, you know, once you're at that level of the Livingston family, you sail down to New York or you send people on a boat down to New York to do your shopping for you. And I, I think I saw this was not a relationship involving uh finances, but one of his fellow supervisors I saw on one of those lists was, I believe, Henry B. Livingston. Uh, on one yes, of those indeed. Lists. Yep. Uh, Henry Livingston would have been the supervisor of Poughkeepsie. He was one of the more southernmost of the, the top tier of the Livingston clan. And of course, there are multiple Henry Livingstons living at the same time because the there's another Henry Livingston who's down in Poughkeepsie who's also the county clerk. Yes. Other questions from anybody? Hearing none, I want to thank Will for a really stupendous detail uh, program this evening. Uh, I learned a lot and those of us who think that those ledgers of accounts uh, may be nothing more than just a lot of scribbled uh, numbers need to look more carefully. Uh, there's a lot of history there and it tells us a lot about what was going on. Uh, and thank you for Will, Will for a uh, very interesting look at this part of New York State during the period just before, during, and immediately after the revolution. So good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us for yet another meeting of the Rhinebeck Historical Society. Good night, thank everyone. You. Good night.